So this week we're going to talk about price discounting and when you shouldn't do it and the cases where it makes sense to do it. I think we should start and define what we mean by discounting. So my, my background training was in economics. And so I have very, I have strong feelings about how we define these things. So pr price discounting for me is really just a subset of price discrimination. So, and price discrimination is where you have the same product and you're selling it to different customers with a different price for each customer or a different price for each group of customers. Discounting then would be if we're going to anchor the price with, let's say a list price. And I say, Hey, this pizza, the list price of this pizza is $12, but we're going to, we'll sell it to you for $8 and we'll sell it to this other person for $7 and we'll use coupons or something like that. <clears throat> so that's essentially what discounting is. Now, the reason this makes sense economically is because people have different willingnesses to pay for things, right? So if I'm selling pizzas and if I'm selling one to Dale and Dale likes pizza, Dale is going to pay $12 for a pizza because it's lunchtime. He's hungry and he likes pizza. Somebody else, I might make that same offer. I might say, Hey, would you, John, would you like to buy a pizza for $12? And John says, I can get a bucket of fried chicken for $12. So I'd rather have that because I like fried chicken better. And then I say to John, I'll sell it to you for $10. And then John says, well, that's actually a good deal because I'm saving money. And I, I like pizza enough that I'm willing to, to take that deal. The problem is how do I get Dale to pay $12 and how do I get John to pay $10? Because I don't want to publish my price of $10 just to get John to buy the pizza because then I lose $12 on what Dale would have paid. So this is the, is the crux of the issue that people face when they are, are thinking about discounting. The other thing to think about is not just between groups of customers, but one customer individually. How do we discount for one customer individually? In the case of pizza, let's say I'm selling it by the slice. I say, Dale, I'll sell you a slice of pizza for $3. And Dale says, that's great. And then he finishes his pizza and I go back to him. I say, hey, would you like another piece of pizza for $3? And he says, no. I'm full. I've had enough. I've had enough pizza. And then I say, well, I'll sell you the second piece for $2. And he says, okay, that's a, I like the first piece. I'm, I'm still a little hungry. It's a good deal. I feel good about it. So I'll take your offer. So that's a parallel situation to what we might think of later on in the conversation about volume discounting. So that's a primer on the microeconomic theory of price discounting. There's also a psychological angle. And I know Dale, you've read and consumed a bunch of research on this piece. There's been a lot of research over buying pattern about buying patterns and specifically around the use of discounting over research that goes back 65, 70 years now. And so one of the things where you see price discounting is someone says, we need some more revenue. It's the end of the quarter and we're not going to make our numbers. <laughs> you know, let's do a BOGO, buy one, get one. And the assumption is that it's going to generate more revenue. What it, if you look at the research, I would say going back decades now, what is that it actually produces significantly lower bump of revenue than you think, because much of what you're doing is you're, you're taking future buyers that are going to, that would buy anyway, that are buying, that will be buying in the immediate near future. And you're pulling them forward in time to buy now. And so one of the, the classic things that you see is that you'll see a revenue increase and then once the discount's over with, you'll see a revenue decrease below your baseline. And this is representing the people that you pulled in from the future to buy today that aren't there to buy in the future. What often happens is the revenue bump, once you get all of these effects out of the system, is significantly less than what people think it is. The other problem is who takes the discount? And so if you're doing the end of quarter discount and so it's two weeks before the end of the quarter and you need some more revenue to make your numbers and you throw something out for a two week, two week campaign to discount, the most likely people to be aware that you're, that the discount is out there are your most frequent buyers. And so these are the people who are most likely to buy from you at your regular list price. If you're an infrequent buyer, if you're buying once every six months or once a year, then you know, almost certainly you will not even know that the discount was offered because you're not paying attention. So the vast majority of the people that take the discount are your most frequent buyers who have already proven that they will buy at your list price. 
the other thing that happens and, and the other argument that you see is we will pull in new buyers that will become permanent customers because once they see what amazing stuff we have, they'll never leave. And again, we've got decades of research on this. And what is universally when a non-buyer is pulled in purely based on a discount, once the discount's over with, they immediately revert to their long-term buying behavior, which means that there's very little, if any, residual accrual of net new accounts as a result of a discount. That it's much tougher than just throwing a discount out to be able to get a new customer in. And the other problem in here is because you're giving the discount away with little net bump in revenue, once all of the effects are taken into account, and because you're giving those discounts away to people who are already willing, for the most part, to buy at list price, what you're seeing is a significant drop in profits compared to any sort of a bump you're going to get in revenue. And so there's almost no economic case to be made for these sorts of periodic discounting campaigns. They just, they just don't do what you think they're going to do. Now, there, there is a place elsewhere for discounting. And there's a variety of use cases for that. But the most common place that I've seen it, which is we need some extra revenue this week, you're really stealing from the future. And you're putting yourself in the hole in terms of profits, which is what the business is there for, not revenue. Yeah, I'd agree with that 100%. Discounting should never be a promotional strategy. Yeah. So I've definitely, in my past, I have done the end of quarter, dis end of year discount on instrumentation where it's the instruments 125,000. And if you can buy it by December 31st, then we'll sell it to you for $115,000. And this is not something that was put out in a campaign or anything. It's just done by me as a salesperson, one off with customers. And what I found was some people would buy by the end of the year. And then every time you go to sell something else, they wait till the end of the quarter or the end of the year because they know they have leverage and they're that I'm willing to negotiate at that point in time. The other thing that would happen is people would not buy and then January 10th rolls around and they'd say, we want 115,000 anyway. Blue situation as a salesperson and I have basically disavowed promotional discounting for that reason. I offer a fair price. If the customer wants to take it, that's great. If they don't, we're always going to lose some buyers because the value isn't enough to justify the price. Yeah. And where that is set is not the salesperson's decision. It should be a marketing decision. And I'll give you a, a very direct personal anecdote. There was a period of time where I was buying into the seven figures per year of capital equipment. So instruments, servers, variety of different things. I had a multi-million dollar budget and I would intentionally do my buying patterns where I would key up or, or you know, queue up the salesperson mid quarter, get everything I needed to know to be able to make the purchase. And then I would wait till the last two weeks of the quarter. And then I call the salesperson up again. And then we would talk about discounts and, and you would always get them. Yeah. And everything I bought was based on that pattern because I knew that everybody would, would be desperate to make their numbers in the last two weeks of the quarter. And the fact is I was going to buy it anyway. It was already budgeted. I'm just timing it, knowing when the discount periods are going to be. Yeah. And there are plenty of vendors that don't listen to our live streams that are going to continue to be receptive to those offers. Very good advice for purchasers. I don't disrespect customers when they come to me and say, can you discount the price? And of the 150 accounts that I sell to on an annual basis, it's probably like one or two that I know ask every single time. And my answer every single time is we only, our pricing is this and this is how it works. <laughs> now, all that said, I think there are some potentially useful forms of discounting, but they don't enter into a promotional sphere. They're really price and more of a price structural sort of format. And as an example, I'd throw out pricing by industry segment. And so in research tools, this is something we see a lot as we know, pharmaceutical companies have a much higher willingness to pay for reagents than especially expensive ones than do academic customers. And so some companies will have, um, a price discount that applies across the board for academic customers. And for me, that sort of structural discount that's in place all the time makes sense because that's an, a, a legal and effective form of price discrimination because we're preserving the high price for the high value customers. And we're able to also capture the demand from the more price sensitive customers without 
sacrificing the high value ones. Yeah, and and I've easily seen tenfold plus difference in price for the exact same product, depending on whether you're selling it to a postdoc <laughs> in an academic lab or you're selling it to a clinical lab director in a high throughput diagnostics lab attached to a medical center. So the value of the product is not related to the product, is related to the value that the user receives. Hmm. And, and so all you're doing there is basically putting the price into alignment with the value of different uses. And, and this is a very good way to do price discrimination, which is not the same as discounting. So the hang up that I see with that is that, and I, I've had some clients that, that do that. The hang up that I see is there's two catches. One, you have a better, have a pretty good understanding of what the value to the customer is before you try to do that. The second one is you better hope your competition is on the same page. And so I've encountered this situation where, okay, we're selling a, some type of reagent and it's used in discovery context. And then we have another customer that came in and wanted to use it in a GMP manufacturing context. And my client said, oh, since they're using it in GMP manufacturing, they must be willing to pay a lot more. So we'll just double or triple or whatever they did to the price. And I said, I don't really like that, but that you're the client. That's how we're going to do it. And what happens is the competition doesn't play that game. The competition would sell at the same price to discovery customers that they would, as they would sell to GMP customers. And so the extra value might be there, but the customer has a competitive alternative that is going to essentially do the same thing. For them. Yeah. And in many ways, your pricing is tied to the price of the, the best available alternative. Yeah. You can't break the market. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. But so what are some of the other uses for discounting? So I think volume is an important one there. The concept, it's the slices of pizza. It's that for the 10th or the hundredth item that you purchase, there's a sort of a decreasing utility to the customer. You could say it's going to be the same. Oftentimes there is decreasing utility, but there's also a decrease in, in the cost of serving that customer to provide that order. So if I sell one piece of pizza and I have to cook an entire 16 inch pie to generate that, then it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you come in and you say, Hey, I want eight pieces of pizza, that's a much more efficient use of my pie. So I can then reduce the price that I sell that to you. And I think if you go in any pizza shop and you add up the price per slice, it's always going to be less than a pizza. It's the same thing that applies to antibodies and the same thing that applies to microscopes and, and everything else is that if you're able to do things in large batches, the salesperson only has to deal with one customer. The logistics people only have to ship one box. You're able to recognize the decrease in your marginal costs for larger, larger units of sale. And the other thing that, that I've seen done around pricing in general, not just discounting is this idea of cost plus that, and, and I cannot tell you how many dozens of times I've seen this where you, you have these you know, huge elaborate spreadsheets, analyzing all of the production and distribution cost for a given product. And then they add 15% and that's their price. And the deal is that the price should be set based on the value of the product, not on what it costs to make it. If unfortunately you can't make it for less than the value of the product, then you don't have a product and you probably don't have a company, but, but if you can sell it for a hundred times the value of the product, or the, the cost of making it, if that represents the value, that's a legitimate price. And another use, and this is something that I've done in multiple instances, is it's hard to know what the market will bear because in general, as you raise your prices, you're going to have less demand. As you lower the prices, you're going to have more demand. If you give it away for free, you'll have even more demand. If you pay, if you bundle every shipment of that reagent with a hundred dollar bill, you'll sell even more of it. <laughs> and yeah. so there is a curve called the price elasticity curve that represents this relationship between how much the market wants and, and versus the price that you set it at. And you don't have complete freedom because you have, you have competitors that are, that think they should sell everything at 15% above their cost of production. But, but to the extent that you've got freedom, it's useful to know what the shape of that curve looks like. And really the only way of doing that is through a very structured, highly focused, targeted discounting process where you anchor high 
And then you start offering different levels of discount and look at what the response rates are. So you're trying to map that price elasticity curve to get a sense of, you know, what the market will bear in terms of pricing and what the level of demand is, because you're not looking for the maximum possible price. You're looking at the price that produces the greatest amount of revenue. So you may drop the price some. And for instance, I was in the oligo business during the days when the market was exploding. And what we would see is that every time the price dropped by 50%, the market demand doubled. And so it was in everybody's interest to make more and more higher volumes of oligos at lower and lower prices. And because we knew that if we could keep up with this technological arms race, we could get we could grow into a massive market by just getting the price low enough. That's a very unusual case. You usually don't have markets that are that dynamic, but even in fairly stable markets, oftentimes it turns out that people are selling at levels that are not at all optimal because they've never gone in and tried to figure out what's the optimal price, the, the optimal point along the price elasticity curve. And you can absolutely go out into the market and measure it with these with very targeted campaigns. And it's something that everybody should be out there doing. And it, it also will take into account how you're perceived versus your competitors, because if you're perceived as better known or more reliable, or there's some aspect of the product that, that differentiates you from competitors, that also gives you what's called pricing power. So the ability to sell at a higher price without losing an equivalent level of market share compared to your competitor. Yeah. I, so I've done similar studies actually selling things. So we had, as a salesperson, I was working for a company, we had a device, the price of the device was 13,000. I'm going to change the numbers for, to protect the innocent. We, <laughs> most salespeople would sell it at 12,000 because there was some discretion the salesperson had and marketing came along one day and said, we actually think this should be more expensive. And they jacked the price up to $20,000. There was pretty much a mutiny on most of the sales team. Like you think customers complain about prices. The sales people complain three times as much when prices go up <laughs> because they think it's going to hurt their ability to sell. The sales people wanted to continue to sell at 12. And I'm like, well, actually, here's an opportunity to make some money. So I, I would go out <laughs> and I tested the market. I would get, I would do several of these a month. And so we do 13 to one client, 15 to another client, 18 to another client, 20. And there was no, we didn't lose a single sale. I didn't lose a single sale based on price. And I think there's, there's an upside there when you think about, okay, how much are you giving away by not having the price at market value? There's a lot of companies that are missing out there. Right. And it can be the difference between surviving and not surviving. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Being profitable, not profitable. The, yeah. the, yeah. the companies that aren't surviving actually make the opposite mistake. They price like up here. They're like, we've got investors and we've done studies and we've got a few peer reviewed papers and we think our value is like up here and the customers look at it and they're like, no. Yeah. And something also to be going back to this idea that you've got, you're constrained in the range of pricing based on what the next best available option is. And so I've seen this a lot in the diagnostic market because you often have older versions of diagnostics, diagnostic techniques, and then you have newer, in some ways, much, much superior diagnostic techniques, but much more expensive. And so it becomes very important to understand what the reimbursement rates are with the existing, with the existing diagnostic tools. And one example was a client that has a really remarkable early detection of lung cancer using sputum, very non-invasive, can be done at home, or the sample collection is done at home. It's, used, it's based on uh, cell flow cytometry analysis, and it's based on the expression of proteins on the cell surface as a result of malignancy. It's a very good test. But the alternative is an old school bilateral chest X-ray and a bronchioscope, which is, turns out to be pretty cheap. And it also turns out that's pretty pretty uh, profitable to the physicians that can do it. One of the other alternatives is, is low dose CT. And so CT scans without, without contrast agents. And, but each of these have prices that are set by CMS, by, by Medicare. And so whatever you're going to do with this new test, you're going to have to fit that in. You're going to have to one, know what the Medicare reimbursement rates are, as well as the insurance reimbursement rates. And you're going to have to fit that in and be able to make that case for why something that's quite different is worth the extra cost. And so there's a, a lot of these issues that really have to be thought through fairly detailed 
around how do you set pricing and where you set it at in order to be able to make the best long-term business decisions. Yeah. So if I was going to summarize our thoughts on this, I would say discount unless you have to. Don't use discounting as a promotional tool, especially a time-limited promotional tool. Don't have discounts that don't make economic sense with regard to your own cost. What, what did I miss there? No, it's a pretty good list. The main thing is don't do it as a short-term promotion. Yeah. It just makes no sense. <laughs> right. A lot of, and people waste time doing this too. Like people do campaigns and campaigns cost time and money to actually execute, let alone the cost of the price margin that you're giving away. Yeah. You're paying twice. You're paying once to, for the campaign and the advertising, and then you're paying all over again in terms of the profit lost from the discount. Yeah. And especially if you're a low margin provider, if you're selling SaaS software and your gross margin is 98% <laughs> because you, you've got no physical deliverables, it's easy to discount. If you're running a 50% gross margin or even less, a 40% gross margin, you've got very little room to discount. You do a 10% discount and, and you're going to find yourself giving away half the profits. And because again, every penny of price discount comes from the profit line directly. And so if you give away $10 of discount, that's $10 less profit that you're making because it's still going to cost you the same to physically produce those items, whatever price you set it at. Good. Let's call it there, Dale. 